Good morning. Welcome to Webster Groves Christian Church, an open and affirming congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I'm Pastor Jeff Moore, and we're glad that you're with us here this morning in the sanctuary and via Facebook. We have some COVID reminders to share and then a couple of announcements about the ongoing life and mission of Webster Groves Christian Church. First, the COVID announcements. As you came into the sanctuary, I hope you noticed that you came in through the center aisle and that our seats are socially distanced and some pews are marked off. Thank you for sitting in the open pews and with people who are in your COVID pod. And when you leave, we ask that you leave through the side aisles. The ushers will have those doors open at that time. Of course, in case of emergency, please quickly and safely find your place to the nearest exit. Thank you for wearing your masks firmly up over your mouth and nose to keep us all safe in this season of COVID. We will not be passing, passing offering plates this morning, um, but there are offering baskets in the rear of the sanctuary where you can drop an offering if you have one. As always, you're encouraged and welcome also to send in offerings via check or bank draft or to use Givelify, our online app. We will be sharing communion this morning. For those of you with us online, we hope that you have elements to participate with communion at that time in our worship. And for those of you here in the sanctuary, I hope that you found the small communion cups with the wafers located in the narthex. Uh, if you still need those, they're available on the tables in the narthex, and we'll be partaking of those later in the service. We will be singing together this morning. Sometimes we'll invite those who are able to stand. We ask that you keep your masks on when we sing and sing gently. And there will be a time when we'll have prayer concerns. I or someone will bring the microphone to you after you've let us know that you've got a concern or a joy. We ask that you allow me to hold the microphone and please keep your mask on during that time. We're delighted that you're here with us this Sunday, and we've got a couple of important announcements to share about exciting opportunities. One, this afternoon at 3 o'clock at Memorial Boulevard Christian Church, that's at 3000 North Kings Highway, there will be a service of pastoral installation. Two new pastors will be installed as co-pastors at Memorial Boulevard Christian Church today. We hope that you'll be a part of that. Um, and if you can, we hope to see you there at 3 o'clock. Thank you to those of you who baked cookies and have been praying in preparation for that event. Our own Brianna Hawkins, who uh, was a student with us and then became a member of Webster Groves Christian Church, is one of the co-pastors. And then the Reverend Dr. Linda Tobias Doss is the other co-pastor. So that's today at 3 o'clock. Please plan to join us or be praying for the success of that event and for the ongoing spirit-filled ministry of Memorial Boulevard Christian Church. And then, a Sunday school note, uh, next week in one of our Sunday school classes, the Koinonia class, there will be a, a guest author. Uh, Koinonia has been reading the book In Defense of Kindness by Bruce Reyes Chow, and uh, uh, Bruce is going to actually be with the Koinonia class via Zoom next week to talk about the book. Even if you haven't been participating in reading the book or with Koinonia, we encourage you to sign on to uh, Koinonia, and the Zoom link is included in our weekly update. And uh, at 9 o'clock, you can join the conversation with Bruce Reyes Chow and others to discuss the importance of kindness in our lives. And a little clue for you, niceness and kindness aren't the same thing. And that'll be something that you can talk about together. So we hope you'll think about joining us next week, either here in the chapel at 9 o'clock or via Zoom uh, with author Bruce Reyes Chow. And now I ask that you open your hearts and minds and prepare for the worship of our God. Yeah. 
source of life, because we have been raised with Christ in his act of total selfless love, we must let go of all that might keep us from you. Temptation is all around us, but you give us your Holy Spirit to steady us. Let us be vigilant and rid ourselves of those things that are negative forces. Rather, help us to seek those activities, words, and choices that keep us rooted in your love and anchored in your grace. Life in Christ opens us to a whole fresh world of inclusion, respect, and abundance. We are all one in you, created, blessed, and loved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. be seated. Good morning, and it's great to have you all with us this morning. And we have a friend with us this morning. You may remember Webster the church mouse. They live here in the church. This is something we only recently discovered, and we even found the door. Well, it happened again. Webster the mouse found out. There. Well, Recently, Webster heard during one of our worship services that we support an organization called Doorways, and Webster wanted to learn more about. So I was telling them about it, but I'd like to remind all of you that Doorways supports people who are living with HIV and AIDS. And I want people to know that HIV is a virus, and it lives inside some people's bodies, And it makes it hard for their bodies to heal because that virus attacks their immune system. So there are some people who are living with HIV who have a very difficult time with getting better when they get sick unless they have the right medicine, unless they have good care, unless they have stable housing, and unless they have good nutrition. Doorways helps all of those things to happen. Well, every year for the last five years, WGCC, along with several of our other disciples' congregations, Union Avenue, Centennial, and Memorial Boulevard, have been doing a barbecue in the spring for the staff and residents at Cooper House, one of the facilities of Doorways. And so, of course, we had to check it out. So here's what happened when Webster and I visited the annual barbecue. Well, it happened again. Webster the Mouse found out about another great ministry of Webster Grove's Christian Church and wanted to see about it. This time, we were off to Doorways, where they provide care for people living with HIV and AIDS. So, we're off again on the motorcycle. 
Doorways has a facility called Cooper House in the Central West End, so Webster and I needed to head downtown and into the Central West End so that we could find that beautiful facility and check out what was going on. We were there for the fifth annual barbecue put on by Disciples Churches for residents and staff of Cooper House. Cooper House helps the people who are living with the most difficulties with HIV and AIDS make sure that they have everything that they need, food, medical care, everything they need to stay healthy, well, and loved. Well, it was a great day for a barbecue, and so we jumped in. We had volunteers from Union Avenue, from Centennial, from Memorial Boulevard Christian Churches, and of course, from WGCC. It was a great day, and Brenda, who takes care of all the food service at Cooper House, loved meeting Webster. She put on a great meal for everyone that day. And there's not a barbecue for WGCC without at least one John. Here's John Christensen manning the grill. It was another great day because Pat Roseman was there and making sure that all of the desserts were ready and we were in a good point to be able to serve all the people who were gonna come and eat. We continued with Webster's help to serve desserts. There were dozens of fantastic desserts. Boy, they looked tasty. Webster had a little bit too, don't tell anyone. Sally and John continued grilling and Webster got in on the action. In fact, Webster thought the grilling looked like so much fun that they got in on helping a little bit more. There's Miss Orvella. She's in charge of the kitchen, works with Miss Brenda at Cooper House and does all kinds of great food day and night. Here's Webster trying their hand at the grill. Careful Webster, that looks hot. Make sure it doesn't burn. Abigail Moore was home from college and got to hang out with us as well. Well, that's all. Hope you had fun. See Webster sometime soon receiving their Oscar for the performances in all of these films. I want to thank Webster Groves Christian Church and Webster and all of the ways that we support doorways. Um, we participate in so many mission efforts, helping people to have enough to eat, a place to sleep, care, and so many other things. Doorways is one of those ways that we share the love of God by acknowledging, caring for, and loving all other people. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your call to us to share it. As we reach out to people at doorways and throughout our community and around the world, remind us always that you want all people to have what they need. Help us as we reach out to others so they can have the medicine, the housing, the food, the companionship, and the care that they need. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you once also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abuse of language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all.
Here in Colossians, we've got language that we saw in many of the Pauline communities. We have many letters from the Apostle Paul. And Colossians, in the name of Paul, talks about some of these same ideas. One of the things we know about how baptism worked in the communities that Paul connected with is that baptism was a time of entering into the community, but it was also a time of transformation. And we know that that transformation was symbolized not only by entering into the water, but by being immersed in the water, much like we do here at Webster Groves Christian Church, as a symbol of dying with, and then as you come up out of the water, rising with Christ. Paul talks about that, and Colossians talks about that, as a dying and a rising, as a putting away and a taking on, and as renewal and transformation. We have here in Colossians a list of things that you don't want to keep doing, right? Different ways of being and speaking and acting because you've got your eye on a new vision, what Colossians calls this heavenly vision, this spiritual vision, a new way to be. Early Christians, in fact, took off their clothes and went right into the baptistry naked and then put on new clothes as they came out as a symbol of what it meant to take off one way of life and be renewed by another way of life. But that's got me thinking this week about how hard that can be. Renewal if it's truly transformative, can be so difficult. And one of the reasons it can be so difficult is because of all the stuff that sometimes has to come off so that the new vision can be realized, so that the new stuff can come on. And it got me to thinking about home improvement shows. You know those home improvement shows where they'll take a room or a house or a building and say, what can we do with this? What's the vision toward which we're working? And then stuff has to change. They did one of those home improvement shows about 15 years ago on my block in Shrewsbury, and what changed is everything. They actually removed an entire house and built a new house in a week for a family that needed better accessibility for one of their children. That child now is grown and has completed schooling and everything, and that new house that new vision helped to facilitate that. But lots of things had to go so the new thing could come. Now, one of the shows that I like to watch takes place in Mississippi. It's called Hometown. And this couple looks at different houses and sees how they can update them for new residents. But every time they look at a house and they say, oh, this paneling's got to go, or this carpet's got to go, or I think the color could be this, or I think the roof could do that, it means that something has to be removed, and it's often difficult. You ever worked on a home improvement project and you knew you had to really do a good job of prepping or the new thing wasn't going to work well? Like, maybe you're painting and you didn't do a great job of scraping away the old paint and preparing the surface. You know what happens. Your new paint job looks pretty good for pretty long, but eventually you're going to be in trouble. That old paint wasn't adhering very well and it's going to start to peel again. Or the surface wasn't properly prepared and you're not going to get the adhesion that you need. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe you said, oh, we've got a little bit of rot here. If we just put some siding up, that'll hide the rot, and it'll never be a problem. The rot's still there, only now it's in the dark and the damp, which rot loves. You can see the vision, right? I want a new paint. I want new siding. I want a new roof. But if you don't deal with the renewal, if you don't deal with the transformation, not everything works well. And the problem is, sometimes it's that taking away, it's that transformative piece of preparing for the new that's such hard work. So I'm a very lazy home improver. And that means that in our bedroom for the last, what would you say, Susan, five years or maybe more, we've had a ceiling fan that sort of works. So the fan wobbles and squeaks, 
and talks to you. And the light bulbs come on and off whenever they want. So you can't really read in bed because you'll get through one page and then the lights will go off and another one will come on. And so it's very interesting. But I knew it was going to be difficult because you've got to take the old fan down and you've got to clean everything up and who knows what you're going to find in that junction box. And then you've got to put a new one up. And so I just didn't do anything. Have you ever not changed because it was going to be too hard work? even though you really wanted the change to happen, even though you believed that that renewal was part of what should happen in your life, even though you knew that it would be part of being a better human being and interacting with others, but it was just going to be such hard work. And then we find excuses not to do it. I'm busy. I have a headache. There's not enough time. My energies are better spent elsewhere. Well, So last month, I ordered a new ceiling fan. Yeah. Step number one. And so it sat in our front hallway for two weeks. And Danny came over and opened it up. And I said, oh, no, don't. don't." He said, Dad, we're putting this up, right? He opens it up. He found out that one of the glass pieces was broken. Well, I was frustrated, but I was kind of glad because that meant now I didn't have to do the work of changing, right? So I sent it back, and they sent a new one, and the new one came. And Danny came over yesterday, and he said, when did this come? I said, oh, it came a couple days ago. He said, you didn't open it? I said, well, no, I didn't. Yesterday we opened it. We installed the new ceiling fan. My shoulders hurt and my neck hurts. But in my room, there's light. All at the same time when you flip the switch, right? And the fan works quietly. I had the vision. I I knew what a room with a ceiling fan looks like. I mean, I've been to other people's houses. I knew what a well-maintained house looks like, right? But the transformation was going to be hard. That's how it is, isn't it, in our lives? Like, I'd I'd like to be less judgmental, but that's that's hard work, right? I'd like to be more inclusive of other human beings, but I I wasn't really trained that way. I'd like to to have a better work ethic, but gosh, that, that seems like, you know, work. Transformation can be difficult, but the thing is, and Colossians wants to remind us of this, God empowers the new vision through a process of transformation. So even though you can see the new ceiling fan or the new paint color or the new siding, even though you can envision the new family room or the new roof or the new landscaping, you know that it's going to require some effort. And many times it requires a stripping away, as Colossians talks about, that might be more than you bargained for. But if, if you don't do the preparation... The transformation can't fully blossom. If you don't prepare the surface, the paint ain't going to stick. If you don't deal with the foundation, the deck ain't going to hold up. If you don't figure out the electrical, the ceiling fan ain't going to work. In our lives, individually, and as a congregation, And as a nation, we are called to share a vision, a vision of God's grace that includes everyone, a vision of wholeness that engages our whole lives, what we eat, what we drink, the health care that we have access to, how we treat and care for one another, and that requires transformation. I've heard a lot of talk about transformation from politicians lately, about making Missouri this way or that way, or how Shrewsbury can be better, or what can we do for St. Louis County or city, or what would it mean for the United States of America. I've even heard Christian language used sometimes about that, and I'm a little frightened in some specific ways, and here's one of them. 
Sometimes when people say, we want transformation in the United States of America and we want it in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm not sure that they're prepared to do all of the stripping away work that needs to happen. An example might be, sometimes it seems like we want transformation, we want renewal, but not down to the base layer. Sometimes we want to go back to that time where it felt okay for me, but maybe it wasn't okay for everybody else. Maybe that for you was the 1980s or the 1950s or the 1850s, right? Whatever it is for you that you think of. Now, that was a time when we were really the people we needed to be, and that might have been true for you, but it might not have been true for everyone. It might have been a time when some people weren't allowed to vote because of the color of their skin or because of their biological sex or because they did or didn't own land. It might have been a time where not everybody's voice mattered or counted because they were harassed and discriminated against. It might have been a time where not everyone had the resources that they needed. And so as we get rid of the things that aren't working so that we can participate in a vision of what can be, it's so important to think about getting right back down to the basics. One good idea might be going back to our founding documents as a nation, but even our founding documents as a nation have got some problems in them, right? They assume taking indigenous land from people and taking their humanity from them. They assume these founding documents, enslavement of hundreds of thousands and then millions of people. They assume gender biases and discrimination. They assume an economic model that doesn't work for everyone. Now, our founding documents are also full of language about freedom and about care and about opportunity and about hope. One of the things that I think is so important for us, whether we're doing home improvement, life improvement, national improvement, is to discern carefully what stripping away needs to happen so that our transformation can best engender the fullest expression of the vision. That's what Colossians is asking us to consider. What's the stuff that you need to get right down to basics about to fulfill the vision of being a new people in Christ? The rewards are great. The rewards are, says Colossians, living in a society where it's not about um, Jew and Greek and Scythian. It's not about all of these differences that are so important in our lives, but there's this coming together, this renewal in Christ. And Colossians tells us, and we know that this is true in lots of our New Testament texts, this has already been accomplished in God's grace. The vision's there for us. We don't have to build it we just have to live and work into it. Thank God when it comes to transformative projects that we don't have to do all the work. So, for instance, yesterday, um, this ceiling fan came partially disassembled. Thank God I didn't have to design and build an entire ceiling fan, right? That was never going to happen. We're lucky it's on the ceiling. God's grace is already there for you. As you think about what's not working in your life and what ways you're not sharing that grace with others, as we think about what's not working in our community or our nation and what we can do to envision a better, more whole, more perfect union, God's grace and love are already there for us. They come pre-assembled. We just have to engage them. Now, I'll admit right here, and not just because he's up in the balcony, that there's no way I would have done that ceiling fan project yesterday if it weren't for my son Daniel. And that's a beauty of engaging in what Colossians reminds us of. Not only is God's grace already there, other people are already there. We are a part of a community of people who believe in God's grace, who have varied gifts and can help one another. Sometimes through encouragement, like well, that's stupid, Dad. Why would you buy something and not install it? You know, loving encouragement like that. 
through actual physical help, I'll hold this. You put in that screw. And through solidarity and accompaniment, as you go through this, I will be with you. The vision's great, isn't it? We talk about Jesus loves me, this I know. The vision is great. We talk about everybody in the world is loved by God. The vision is great. We talk about peace be with you. The vision is great. We sing about kumbaya, come by here, oh God. But transformation is difficult. If we believe in the vision, and I do, I believe in the vision of wholeness and love empowered by God's grace that we celebrate here, then we must be willing to go through the transformation. And if we're going to engage in the transformation, Colossians reminds us there's some stuff that we need to remove so that we can put on the vision. So I invite you this week to be thinking about what is it in your own personal faith walk that's getting in the way of you realizing the vision? What would it take to let that go? What would it take to sand it down? What would it take to prune it? As poet and theologian Julia Esquivel has written in one of her poetries, You pruned me, Lord, and it was painful. But now I can sprout she writes. What are those things? And then ask yourself this. Do you believe God's grace and love are there to empower you as you go through this time of transformation? And If you do, will that strengthen you? And then ask this. Are there words of encouragement or warning that you need to hear from others? to get through the fog of excuses that you might be making. I would be kind and loving to other people, but it's uncomfortable. I would try to work so that the world is more an equitable place, but it doesn't feel nice. I would engage more in this or that or the other. Maybe there are words we need to hear from other people who say, it's time. The fan is broken the box has arrived. The tools are in the garage. I'm here to help you. Let's get it done. I know and believe strongly that there are members in your life and your community and even in this room who will be lovingly present. And then ask this, what's the next step to work toward that process toward that vision of renewal. As a nation, we need renewal as we always have. From day one, every nation has been a candidate for renewal. If we truly want to be the best nation of people that we can so that we can take our place in the community of nations and be a part of a strong world that heals and engages and welcomes then we've got some work to do. We can't just strip back one layer. We can't just go back to that time when everything seemed simpler. You, you ever seen on uh, television shows, sometimes they'll ask people about their guilty pleasure. You know what I mean when I say a guilty pleasure? Something that you like that you're not really supposed to like, either because other people don't like it or because it's not quite right. So one of your guilty pleasures might be a song that like nobody likes. I've got a couple of those. I'm not going to share those. One of my guilty pleasures is the 1960 Western morality play, Bonanza. You, you get me at lunchtime at home, and I'm going to turn on Channel 24 and watch Bonanza. I want to watch those Cartwright boys and what they get up to on the Ponderosa. Now, I'm not supposed to like that. Bonanza takes us back to a time where every single person was carrying a weapon, where some people owned all the land, and they're not the people who had the land for the thousands of years before that, where people are segregated, where women are discouraged, 
all kinds of things about the world that pictures in Bonanza I'm not supposed to like, right? But I like to peel back to that because they are little morality plays, right? In the end, in his own way, Pa Cartwright, played by Lorne Green, does something that might seem heroic or kind or honest or sincere. I'm a sucker for it. The hard work is to peel that back and say, what good do I find in that? What good do I find in being honest and truthful? What good do I find in being generous? And then to ask that and also value all people regardless of their skin color or their gender or their gender expression or identity? Could I do that and not live in a world where everyone's shooting everyone? I've never counted how many gunshots occur in an hour-long episode of Bonanza, but I'm sure it's more than 30. What would it mean to truly transform, right? Transformation isn't just about going back to the time when everything was comfortable. It's about honoring the vision and engaging in the sometimes painful process of moving toward renewal. It's voting time again. I think we've got primary elections already this Tuesday. And then we've got congressional elections coming up in November. Here's what I'm going to try to do this year because of what Colossians is saying. I'm going to try to ask myself, do I see that there are candidates who really believe in a vision and are they willing to guide us honestly through the work of transformation so that vision can be honestly, generously, fully, and inclusively realized? Because that would be a sign of renewal that contains and connects with God's grace and love. I think it's a good strategy for life. It's hard, though. But boy, oh boy, let me tell you, once you get that fan out of the box and you get it on the ceiling and the light shines and the wind blows, it's a different world. What in your life is in need of transformation? What work and support do you need to take that next step? And how can we personally, interpersonally, as a nation and a world, Share a vision toward which we can transform, empowered by God's grace and love. I hope that we'll share that vision, work through that transformation, and count on the presence of the Spirit together. Amen. If you're here with us this morning and you would like to be a part of Webster Groves Christian Church in our ongoing walk to respond to God's grace and love in Jesus Christ, or if you would like to become a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come forward while we sing or to reach out to us via Facebook or email. We would love to pray with you.
corrupted. Each Sunday as we gather, we also gather here at the communion table because we express the vision, a vision of God's wholeness and grace and peace known to us through Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim as risen, and to acknowledge the pain and the difficulty of transformation. As we break the bread, as we pour out the cup, we recall Jesus' life and ministry and his painful death, even as we promote the vision, we engage in the transformation, even as we look ahead to what is to come, even as we proclaim hope. We do so in the midst of a world where there is pain and where there is need for transformation. This is a table where all are welcome, where you will receive challenge and encouragement, where as we share and break this bread and as we pour and share this cup, we participate not only in a remembrance and engagement with Jesus' ministry, but the vision of hope and renewal that Christ brings. All are welcome at this table. Thank you, God, for this precious time. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into ever closer fellowship with you. Reflecting on all that you did on Calvary's cross, please receive our grateful thanks and make us worthy of our call in Christ Jesus to live a life honoring to you. In his holy name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. And as we gather, let us remember that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way, after the supper, he also took the cup. He blessed it, giving thanks to God, and he gave it to them. 
saying, Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I encourage you to partake of the elements. Thank you, loving God, for having invited us and welcomed us at this table of Jesus Christ. As we have shared this cup and broken this bread, we've participated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Transform us, O God. Work within us with your Spirit. Help us to see the vision of your grace, to work with you through Jesus Christ, to share it with the world. We pray these in all things in Christ's name. Amen. We give and receive so many gifts in our lives, in our day-to-day living, and this congregation exists because of the gifts that we all give, that we all share. We acknowledge that they come from God, and then we use them in mission and ministry. I'd like to acknowledge the giving that happens in the life of this congregation to encourage us all to continue to be generous and to remind you that you can give in the offering baskets in the rear of the sanctuary as you leave today. You can give through Givelify, our online app, or you can send contributions here to the church. All of the mission and ministry we do together inside this building and around our community and the world comes from the gifts that we give. And all of those gifts come from God, the most generous of all givers. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we thank you for the gifts that you give into our lives, and we thank you that you call us to contribute, that we might participate in the ministry and mission of Jesus. Bless us, bless the gifts that we receive from you and that we pass on, and bless all of those with whom we partner and share. We pray these and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. as we enter into our time of community prayer, a reminder that we're praying for those in the United Kingdom and for those in Ukraine as we look around the world and think about all of the needs there are. I'd like to ask now, are there any who have prayer joys or concerns to share? I'll bring the microphone to you if so. While I'm walking, um, please keep Pat Roseman in your prayer. Pat Roseman has COVID, and she's at home. She was with us on Zoom this morning, but we want to continue to keep her in our prayers. Well, 
the Shepherd Center is going to have their um, grab and go barbecue right here at outside. Where is it they go do that at? I haven't done it. We've been doing it in the parking lot during COVID. Oh, so are we going to do it there again? Yeah, I think so. Okay, in the parking lot, I guess back here, and I have Pat's ticket and one more ticket that hasn't been spoken for if someone absolutely wants one or two tickets right now. But since I sold them all, does that mean I go and get 10 more? I hope. Okay. <laughs> They're $20, not 25 not 30 I think that's pretty good. And you want to know what we're going to have with it, right? Does it say? Hmm? The date. Oh, well, the date. First of all, they think the date's more important than what you're going to eat. <laughs> They're not Americans, are they? September 9th, 5 to 7. Thank you. Now we're going to have oh. pork. Pulled pork and chicken, the All right. Thank you, Vicki. The Shepherd Center, one of our important ministries uh, that lives right here in this building, their grab-and-go barbecue coming up. Tickets are available. You can see Vicki. $20 is a great deal. All of the prep and everything happens here on site. And then what they've been doing is you can just drive through, and they'll have your order ready to go for you, and it supports the Shepherd Center's important ministries. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask for prayers for a good friend of mine from Cherokee, Oklahoma. Uh, about a week ago, had a heart attack. Uh, they had a metaphylite in Oklahoma City, and uh, they were able to do a stent, and he is recovering and doing okay right now. Uh, they think he he should get to go home about now. So uh, uh, his name is Ike Wessels. There's a whole bunch of, kind of like John's here. There's, oh, this is the last name. There was a lot of Wessels in Cherokee in the church there. And uh, uh, so remember Ike in your prayers. And then I have a joy. Uh, Vicki and I, they, we closed on our house on Friday. We've, we are now staying there. We've got basically everything out of our apartment. And so that's all good. A few problems, but that's, that's life. So congratulations. Welcome home. All right. If you need help with a ceiling fan, don't call me. <laughs> uh, I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, please also keep John Dias in your prayers as he continues to recover from his knee surgery. And Don Hashbarger, uh, who's with us this morning, as she continues to recover as well. Kay. Um, my uh, sister's ex-husband passed away on July 19th while we were gone. And even though they were exes, they were still really close and talked every day and so would you please keep my sister Karen in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep the people of Memorial Boulevard Christian Church in your prayers and their new pastors, Linda and Brianna. Uh, we want to keep all flood victims in our prayers, of course, but you may not know that some of them are right here in Webster Groves uh, in the northeast area near Rocket Ship Park, Marshall, and Summit. Uh, and those people had no flood insurance because they're not in a floodplain, and some people lost everything. So please keep your Webster neighbors in your prayers. And if you're online, you might find that there are ways to be helpful to those uh, neighbors. And also, please know that in responding to the St. Louis area and Kentucky and other flooding, that the disciples are hard at work through Week of Compassion. And so if you're wondering, how can you help other disciples who are responding to the flooding? As usual, Week of Compassion is a great way to do that. You could make a gift to Webster Groves Christian Church and make sure that you put in your memo, Week of Compassion floods, and that'll get where it needs to go. Other joys and concerns this morning? I'll mention one more, and that is that in the course of my work throughout the community, um, I come into contact with somebody whose uh, sibling is ill and uh, about which the family has made the decision to remove life support, and that will be happening tomorrow. So I want to lift that person up and, and their whole family, and also just families as we make decisions for one another about care, about sustenance, about all of the ways that we engage. Uh, and I know that it's difficult and that families don't take those decisions lightly. So we want to keep one another in our prayers as we think about that. Will you pray with me? 
God, for all of those names and people and places that were mentioned, all of the ministries and the health difficulties and the situations and the families, we give you thanks and we lift up our prayers of concern. We ask that you be with those who seek healing, with those who are undergoing transformation, entering into new situations. We ask that you give strength to those who have made it through, but not quite through, a disaster. We ask that you empower us, that we might be good neighbors and solid friends and those who are giving, gracious, and loving, and present. Most of all, O oh God, we thank you for your grace and love known to us through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, remember always that God presents us with a vision of wholeness, and God's grace empowers that vision 
God sets before us an opportunity for transformation, but we do not do it alone. The Spirit guides us and accompanies us, and we travel together. Go forth from this place filled with power, with strength, with hope, and with love. In the name of our God, who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen.